the waiting. The waiting does more for us sometimes than we realize. I sit there and I think about, you know, as a child, I, you know, I grew up in Michigan, moved there when I was 13. We were an outdoor family, winter sport family. And we absolutely, our sport we loved was snowmobiling. That was what we enjoyed to do. We all, my dad, we all, we bought old ones, he'd fix them up, and we each had our own snowmobile. And we'd go out for hours riding these things, loved the winter time, because we got to go snowmobiling. Absolutely loved it. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many hours that, and I'm sorry, as a teenage boy, there's just nothing better than getting behind the, the, the wheel of something that you can drive as fast as you want to without a speed limit. I know, it's scary, but as a teenager and as a child, you absolutely loved it because you could get a snowboard and drive it 70 miles an hour down, and there wasn't anything illegal about it. Uh, but just absolutely, we had so much fun. We had fun just going out and driving in circles in a field, just chasing each other in circles out in the field. But I will have to say, you usually got our first snow in December, but actually in November. Enjoyed December going out snowmobiling. January was so much fun being able to go out. By February, you kind of start getting a little bit tired of it. By the time March rolls around, you're really ready for spring. By the time snow's still falling in April, and you're celebrating Easter with white on the ground, it gets, you're really, really ready for that transition. You're ready for the next season. I say anything about even in Arkansas, we, we hit that period where we're ready for spring. We're ready to see the green on the trees. We're ready for that nice, warm, non-humid air. That's the best thing about spring and fall in Arkansas is the humidity level going down. And you get to open up those windows and you get to enjoy that fresh, warm breeze flowing through your house without everything feeling all sticky. So even in Arkansas, we, we run to that point where we start kind of anticipating this. And if you think about it, even while we're anticipating for these things, for those of us that have ever had gardens or prepared for the spring, and we all have at some point, what do we do? Our, 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 our state of mind starts to change a little bit. We begin to think and plan a little differently going into spring than what we did from winter. Or from spring in the summer, summer in the fall, take all the seasons. We hit a certain point where we're now waiting and we're ready for the next season. But we begin to think and plan differently. In the fall, everyone starts thinking, ooh, I got what am I gonna get all my warm clothes out and get the pumpkin spice everything ready, because we gotta pumpkin spice everything to death in the fall. And then we also run into that, like I said, that spring one. How many of us have gone out and started planting a garden? Got our seeds, started our little seedlings, got everything prepped, going out, going out, start tilling the soil up and getting everything ready to go. Again, it's kind of a state of mind. And this passage of scripture this morning that Sherry read for us, it speaks of a fig tree in this passage of scripture. It speaks on a change of seasons. But it's not in the same sense that we think of. This text itself is not about a fig tree. And if you look, this is in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 36. And you might think it's a little bit odd that this is a, this is a passage of Scripture that we're talking about from Christmas time. A lot of times we like to read the passages of Scripture that talk about the Christmas story, about the manger, and, and you know, we're going to get there. But this very first Sunday, we're talking about the anticipation of hope. And that's what this text is talking about. It's talking about the hopeful anticipation. Again, it's not about the fig tree. It's not about the hopeful anticipation of summer's warm rays. It's about something even greater. The coming of the Lord. You see, I think there's a time when, when it feels like our, our storehouse, our reserves are depleted. When it feels like we just can't make it anymore. We're just wore down. This world is just beat us down. We're exhausted. We're tired. But there's good news. The Messiah is coming. 
then that's good news. I mean, I don't, wherever we're at, however our year went, we're now in that time of the year where maybe we've had a rough year. We may have had, maybe we got hit by one thing after another, after another, after another, and it's just been a rough year. But we're in that time of the year where there's good news. The Messiah is coming. As we sit in this season of Advent, we are reminded again that the trees will bud and that, the, that again, that He is coming. You see, what is offered here is offered both with great hesitancy and great certainty. See, there's hesitancy in the specific interpretation, but certainty in the reality of the work of God in history. The grace of God to sustain His church through the periods of trial and the ultimate triumph of the kingdom of God in the return of Christ at the end of the age. That second coming. These may seem like very separate events. And in one sense, they are very two separate events. But they're also tied together. We sit here and we focus at the manger. We focus at the baby Jesus, the nativity. And that was one event. And we have the second coming of Christ that we look forward to with hopeful anticipation. And they are separate events, but they're tied together. They are linked together. You see, the first coming of Christ in the incarnation carried with it the promise and the guarantee of the triumphant second coming. Jesus talked about the times in between these times. Between the first coming and the second coming. The last days. The days of the church. And the signs that would characterize them. You see, we live in these between times. Between the first and the second coming. We're called to live in faith, trusting God's sustaining power in trial, not knowing the day or the hour. We don't know when the second coming is. Matthew 25, 13 specifically tells us that. We are also called to live expectantly, rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. There's that word again, hope. Romans chapter 5, 2 tells us that, that we are called to live expectantly. You see, Jesus is looking into the future, to the second coming, into the final triumph of the Son of Man. Though the Christian does not know the day or the hour of Christ's coming, he should know that when these things come to pass, his final deliverance is soon to come. And he can lift up his head. The Son of Man will come with power and great glory. You see, believers who await the second coming and are to be watchful of the signs, to see in them the verification of God's unfailing word. But in the meantime, disciples are to watch and be ready. not dispute or grow careless. They will be they, they will to be prepared to stand before the Son of God. You see at the second coming there will be only two classes of people. Those who are ready for whom Christ's coming was going to be a supreme pleasure. Those of us that are going to look at it, we're going to have smiles on our faces. And those who are not ready, for those who's his, who for his return is going to be a stroke of doom. You see, the text in the Old Testament that this passage refers to, refers to, it speaks about justice. And let's face it, Justice can be a scary thing. 
How many of us have ever, I, I'm going to how many of us have ever gotten nervous, and I love this one, or seen somebody get nervous driving by a cop parked on the side of the road? Yeah, everybody slows down. And let's face it, how many of us, and you're driving along, and you see everybody, you see everyone slamming on their brakes yeah. as they're driving by this cop. Oh, yeah. They get a little nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think they get a little nervous? If they were going, I, I'm one of those people, I drive along, I go zoom in my by those people, I'm just going to tell you that. I have my cruise set, I know I'm driving the speed limit, and I go whizzing right by all those people that are slamming on their brakes to go 10 miles underneath. Like the cop didn't already, if he was going to catch you, he would have already caught you by now. That radar got you before you even knew it. But a lot of times we get a little nervous, a little scared when we see it. Because again, maybe we feel a little guilty. It's that justice, it's that thought of that justice. We don't want that ticket. Because let's face it, were you nervous because you didn't do anything wrong? Or were you acting in an unjust way? We have a tendency to approach these texts with fear. But fear is not, to meant, is not meant to be the way for the people of God. It's not about fear. Jesus' words are about redemption, not condemnation. We should not fear the return of Christ. And at the heart of this text, it tells us exactly what we should be seeing. Redemption. The signs are not those of destruction, but of restoration and renewal. We're not to cower, hide, or dread the coming of the Messiah. Rather, we are to stand tall, lift our heads, because this is good news. Redemption is coming. Advent and the coming of Christ are about the hope of redemption of the past and for our future. The Messiah brings justice and freedom. The Messiah brought those things. But he didn't bring him in the way that we expected. This tells us that they were not expecting a lonely baby to be born in a manger amongst the animals, amongst the filth and the dirt. And even later on in his life, they did not expect him to be triumphant, to save them in the manner that he saved them. They didn't expect death of their Savior to be their salvation. The Messiah didn't build a kingdom by destroying. The Messiah built the kingdom through love and mercy. We have to be careful because when we long for the return of Christ, we can often look and hope for the destruction of those that have broken the law. And I'm going to tell you, how I've caught myself saying this very same phrase. They'll get theirs in the end. They'll get their just rewards. How many of us have said that in our lives? Because I know I have. Because we were looking, we're looking for justice. But we're looking at justice in the wrong way. Maybe we should be looking for the ways God wants to bring justice and redemption. Justice doesn't mean annihilation or revenge. And there's a thing we've got to understand about that. Yes, there is going to be a repercussion one day. Like it said, there's going to be two types of people. Those that are joyful and those that aren't. And we have to, there is going to be that. But that's not the point of justice. It is an effect of justice, but it is not the point of justice. See, justice means making things right. That's what justice is. It's making a wrong right. 
But so many times we take our earthly idea of justice and we try to transfer that unto God. Because we have our earthly form of justice. We, we know exactly it, it's, you know, oh, they're going to get their rewards. They're going to get it. <coughs> See, people in this world have, I think, have such a tendency to associate hatred, anger, and intolerance, let's face it, with Christianity. We hear it all the time. Any of us that have ever witnessed and talked to a non-Christian, there is that feeling there. That they associate for some reason that that that, that we're that we're, we're hate that, that we're, we're full of hatred or anger, and that should be the farthest from the truth. But I can't help but wonder why. Maybe we're too quick to associate wrong the, the, the bad stuff with justice. We have a bad tendency, and we have within the church, to use scare tactics. To make people do what we want them to do. We ran into this. Uh, we had a, a church camp that I was at. And that was the tactics that were used for our teenagers that week. You want to stay sexually pure, teenagers, because if you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. That's all that was talked about when it came to sexual purity. It wasn't about the blessings that God wants to bestow upon us. The great things He has for us if we are to stay sexually pure. It was being focused on the wrong thing. Honoring your mother and father. I got to listen to a speaker talk about physical discipline and honoring your mother and father in the same lesson. Do you honor your mother and father because you're afraid you're going to get your rear end whooped? No. We have had a bad tendency to use scare tactics. To use our earthly sense of justice. You see, we hope not for revenge or destruction. But for even the worst things to be made right. We don't want to hope for revenge or destruction on our enemies. What are we to do to our enemies? Love them. We're to love our enemies. But you know, it's really easy sometimes when we get into the midst of all this stuff. And we begin to sit there and think about and we start to anticipate and we begin to think. It's easy to miss the Messiah in our midst. We can get so focused on the grandeur of the temple while missing that Jesus is in our midst. That video that I showed a few weeks ago of, uh, of the Salvation Army and of, of William Booth's vision, that's what, what were they doing? They were focused on the mountain and looking up to the mountain of God while all the time... God was out in the ocean saving those people, trying to save those people. Because let's face it, we have a tendency to come into our churches even, and to sit here and look at everything and just go, wow, look at the beauty and the grandeur of all that we have. And we begin to just sit there and go, I can't wait for Jesus to come again. And we just, that's all we do is we just sit around just wishing and hoping and waiting See, that's one of the reasons I love this picture of the baby Jesus down here. He's down here at the foot of the tree. He's not hidden up somewhere. He's not at the top of the mountain. He's down here among us. He wasn't in some big palace raised up somewhere. He was down amongst us. If you look at Scripture and the life of Jesus... And there was all this talk of the day of the Lord. They talked about it all the time. They were anxious. They were ready for the Messiah. Scripture told them the Messiah was going to come. They were ready for it. They were talking about it. They are talking about it at hand, that it was at hand. But all the while, he was present among them. There was 
anticipation of what was to come, but they allowed the anticipation to be right here, right now. While we wait, for, wait in the hopeful expectation of Christ's return, we cannot, excuse me, we cannot overlook the places where Christ is at work already. The kingdom is now. It came with Jesus to earth, but it hasn't been fully, it has not been fulfilled. We cannot miss the signs of now, of God's presence, for the sake of the signs of the future. We do not know when the Lord's return is going to be. It could be any second. I mean, we can just wait just a second and... No. Well, then. Is it now? No. How about now? We, we, we could, it, it could be. But redemption is happening now. Justin, justice and redemption in their fullness will come too. But we just have to look forward with hopeful anticipation. So, what does anticipation look like to you? What does the anticipation of hope look like in your life? Are we trying to help prepare and get ready? Or are we sitting back and saying, I'm good, so I'm just going to sit here and wait. I'm going to wait while everyone else out there is lost. Maybe we sit there and just go, hey, they'll get theirs. I'm, like I said, they're going to get their just rewards. I'm good. Maybe we even revel in their looming judgment. This list could go on and on and on. But think about what the anticipation of Christmas looks like in your life. Getting the tree ready, shopping, cooking, getting all your lists done, checking everything off. Is that what the anticipation of Christmas looks like in, in your life? You see, redemption is about restored lives with God. So while we wait for Christ to return, may we live a life full of anticipation, helping others be redeemed through the Christ child that has already come. So remember, they're connected. May this remind us of what he has done. But may it also give us hope and anticipation of what is to come. May this anticipation spur us to action. You see, our past points us to our future, or his past <clears throat> points us to his future. So this morning, go forward and live a life of hopeful anticipation, allowing the anticipation to move us to action and not the law of contentment. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I just come before you this morning. And Lord, as we enter into this season of Advent, Lord, as we, we, we look at this season of hope, and Lord, the thing for this year, Lord, we, as we've seen this, our theme this year is a thrill of hope. And Lord, we know there is a thrill that comes along with it the anticipation, the excitement that comes along with it. Think about that same excitement that we have as a young child waiting to open our presents on Christmas morning. Or maybe we'd be reminded of what that excitement and that anticipation drove us to do. That we stay focused on you and the great things that you have to have that you have for us. And what that drives us to. And not just be focused on a Santa Claus that we need to make sure we're on the good list because we want our present. Because that's what, Lord, we know that's what that anticipation drives us to in that. But Lord, what does our anticipation of you drive us to? 
May that be the question that we each leave here this morning asking. May that be something that is on each and every one of our hearts. Lord, and may you help encourage that. May you help enlighten us. May you help us as we seek to see what this season means to us. What this hope means in our lives, Lord. May you help blossom and encourage that. Help give us the voice, your voice and direction, Lord. So we want this season to be something new. May you make this something new for us. May we have a Christmas season that we have, unlike one that we've had for many years. One where we anticipate, hopefully, for what you have to bring to us. Lord, what you've already brought to us. Lord, just be with each and every one of us. Be with us as we leave here, as we're surrounded with what the world wants to throw at us. May our hearts, minds, actions stay directed to you here this morning and what you have for our lives. In your name, amen. Stand and sing. <laughs>